No nose picking. Uh, is my OA, am I straight? So I was going to say, like, I didn't <laughs> even wear my nose ring. I made sure about didn't, you know. Why not? Because every time I do, I sit there and I look like I'm picking my nose. I just be like, I hold it. I'm, just like, <laughs> I'm like, you know, I just kind of make sure. All right, we ready? Ready. All, All right, right, here we go. We are live on Facebook, <laughs> and everyone just heard about the nose picking. So I'm cool. Yay. I love nice. that for us. All right, we're going to yeah. start recording we'll on the mixer outtakes. in five, four, three. Welcome to the Black Sheep Recovery Warfare Podcast, where it is our mission to debunk the lies of the enemy and announce freedom to those still lost in the darkness and addiction. Welcome to another episode of the Black Sheep Recovery Warfare Podcast. I am Brother Phoenix, and I am joined in the studio, as usual, with the beautiful and very intelligent uh-huh. Stacey. <laughs> uh, once again, we want to thank David Dillmore at Born Again Roofing Company. David is our goal sponsor this month. We are grateful for the opportunity to work with David and his ministry. Thank you, David. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. Today, we are joined in the studio somebody that's very special to me. Finally joined in Finally. the studio. Finally. Finally. Finally doing so, it. <laughs> so this woman is going to share her story today, her yeah. journey through darkness. <sighs> Here we go. And into the light. And I'm going to tell you how much this woman means to me. Um, when I, uh, I met her at my first recovery meeting at the Foundry. And I gravitated toward her because she reminded me so much of my little sister. After a few short conversations, we figured out that she actually knew my little sister. Mm-hmm, and did. after some more conversations, we, we learned, I, I, I figured out that she had a, a lot in common with Amanda. And through that, um, she is definitely a part of my tribe. She is not just my sister in Christ. She's my sister. Most definitely. She's one of my closest confidants. Um, I, I can turn, I turn to her all the time. Uh, I bet. My <laughs> Make me cry. So when so when the when God promised me that He would restore a family to me, He was not playing. He literally restored a little sister to mm-hmm. me. Oh. You gonna stop it? You gonna make me? <laughs> Where cry. are the tissues at? I Let's know, go right? ahead and get like those. We're on. already gonna put tissues into this mix. Well, I've been, I've been, I've been very super psyched about this episode for a long time because I've been wanting to say, uh, mm-hmm. not just say that, but I, I want the eyes and ears that hear. I know it's gonna touch. So many people. I know it's going to pull. Are you ready to pull some people out of darkness? I am always ready to pull some people out of darkness. Awesome. That is the ultimate goal. I have heard this this story uh, a few times, and I'm here to tell you: p- get your popcorn ready because oh because this it's, is it's one for this the no pressure, no, so. no pressure, no pressure, I no mean, pressure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, it, it's only the treacherous life that I went yeah, through. Showing that deepest, darkest I mean, secrets. Hey, it's cool. Let's yeah. just put it all out on the table for the whole world to hear. <laughs> and, and with popcorn, see. with popcorn, yeah. you know, Absolutely. lifetime event. Yeah. <laughs> so Chelsea, I want you to just let the spirit lead this, and and you can start wherever you feel comfortable starting, and you can you have the mic. Oh goodness. Well. um... <laughs> Oh, where do we start? Well, so I had a decent I, childhood. Well, I've, I've got. You want to talk? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I've got a good oh, jumping point. It doesn't really matter where you want to start. Something, <laughs> something just hit me. I, I'd like for you to start where, where at your first <laughs> church or hurt where you went to that uh, that church. You grew up Catholic, right? I did grow up Catholic. Yeah. I did. Um, I I didn't go to church a whole lot, but I I did grow up Catholic. Um, you know, I I was one of those where you know, grandma was Catholic, daddy was Catholic, and we went to the Catholic church all the time, you know, for holidays and stuff like that. Um, I literally would tell my mom, please don't make me go to church, I'll be having, you know, and it was like the the grandma expected it. Yeah. So, you know, but then when we moved to Alabama, um, (laughs) Lord, you would mention this, John. (laughs) (laughs) So when we moved to Alabama, we lived in a town called Hoover, and, Uh you know. I know about that. Okay, so I moved from New Hampshire to Alabama. So here I am. First off, I'm the Yankee. I sound different than everybody. I look different than everybody. I'd like, you know, up north, they don't do, they didn't do the whole get pretty thing like they do in the south. So here I am, the whole new experience, and I decide I'm going to go. Now, which one do you want? The the Baptist <laughs> church one or when I went with the amazing, uh, amazing no, the, I want the one where the, the the pastor literally told you that you were. Oh, yeah, that's the Baptist okay, church. So, okay. Yeah, that's so, the one I'm talking about. All right. So, 
I decide that I'm going to go to the gigantic church that's, uh, you know, across the street from where we lived, um, Hunter Street Baptist Church. Sorry, Hunter Street. Don't take me down <laughs> for this. Um, so I go in there and, you know, the pastor, I'm looking around and everybody's doing their thing. And I'm like, this is not like Catholic Church. Like, <laughs> we're not, we're just not doing the same thing here. And um, the pastor's like, well, you're kind of different, you know, wh- wh- what's, you, what's your story? And I was like, well, you know, I was raised New England Catholic. He looked at me and he said, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, for what? He said, you're going to burn in hell. Oh my. <laughs> wow. And I looked at him and I was like, okay, well, on that note, and y'all, I literally, I walked out and this was before cell phones really were a big thing. And I literally, I walked my little butt right back across that highway, back to the little condos mm-hmm. where my parents lived. And I was like, we're done with this. We're not doing church anymore did it tried how it. old were you i'm out i was 14 i was yeah 13 or 14 because i was like sixth grade so that's yeah. yeah like 13 or 14 years old so what what message did you get like what message did you internalize from that event as oh, a 14 15 gosh. year old girl i was like i don't know what this is all about but this is just not you know i'd never really had god really put on me growing mm-hmm. up you know we went to church for holidays and stuff like that but it was never a a big thing, you know, like my dad was raised, you know, altar boy did the whole thing, you know, but it was never really a big thing for us. So when I went to this church, it was more like I wanted to fit in, you know, um, all these girls were real pretty and, you know, real, real preppy. Yep. And you uh-huh. know what I'm saying? And, and everybody was like, oh, if you're going to get in, you, you got to go to this church. Like, you got to look where the part. Too, go. huh? You got to look the part. Yeah. So first off, I made my daddy take me to Abercrombie and Fitch and buy the whole get up. You know what I'm saying? And then I go into the church, and I'm like, okay, I've got this. I, I've got yeah. it. I figured out how to flat iron my hair and blow dry my hair. I put on the makeup, which was not a big thing for me, you know, growing up up north. It, it just, it wasn't in our lifestyle as much. Mm-hmm. So I went from being more of the tomboy that, you know, rode bikes with all the boys and was out there playing rough and tough with the guys to, you know, okay, we're going to be pretty and we're going to do the pretty side. And if you're not pretty, you're not in. Mm -hmm. And so then I felt the pressure of that. So then I walk into this church and I'm literally like, I'm trying to fit in. And I'm like, okay, so this is how you fit in because this is what they all do. And this was not it. Yeah. Like it was not it at all. And then I just felt like, oh, wow. So maybe the God thing's not for me. Maybe this isn't for me with the pretty thing. So then I kind of started like veering towards the whole other aspect of life, and I started getting in trouble. Mm-hmm. I, if, if I'm not going to fit in over here, yeah. then I'm going to go to the place that I do fit in. Yeah. And and that, like, example that you gave reminds me, it was almost like you had a, a tangible, physical, lived experience of the idea that so many people have that I have to clean myself up before I can come to Jesus. 100%. I have to get it all together. I have to look the part, act the yep. part before God will accept me versus coming to him the way that I am and then letting him clean me up. Exactly. When in all, when in all reality, it's supposed to be come as you are. Right. Bring your it garbage is. with you. Bring your suitcase, bring all that luggage with you. And, and, and what she went through was... You know, perfect definition of church hurt. Yeah, and it is, you know. and that, and it, and it literally turned me. Like, yep. y'all, I went from trying that to like. Next thing you know, I had my my bedroom was like plastered with like crazy pictures all over the walls. I was, you know, acting out. Um, mm-hmm. I got in with a different group. Um, you know, I was already struggling with the whole identity of going from one side of the United States to the total other. Mm-hmm. Like you're talking about two polar opposites. Like. Yeah. And so I went through that, and then it was like to find my niche and find my group made it even harder. And then when I thought I found my group, my group was not what I thought it was, Mm -hmm. and my group was trouble. Like, I was getting into trouble, um, sneaking out to go drinking. Um, Actually, I ended up getting arrested. Um, I had this bright idea I was going to sneak out of the house, right? My mom was out of town, and my dad was home. My dad slept like a rock. This was during the days, you know, old days of house phones, you know? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, so I cut the ringers off on the house phones and um, snuck out the window with my friend. Well, we ended up getting pulled over drunker than Cooter Brown. Are we the same person? I, I, oh. I, I'm not. I think all three of us. Yeah. Look, I, it was rough. And like, I got pulled over with another friend of mine. Well, they ended up arresting us. Um, they were like, look, we won't take you to juvenile if we can get in touch with your father. 
Well, I had turned the ringers off yeah. on the phones, y'all. So I ended up having to sit in juvenile in, in Shelby County, Alabama, for 72 hours. And when I got out, now, y'all... did sleep like a rock. Y'all, I'm not even lying. I'm not lying. When I got out, I did not want to get out. Like, I kept telling him, I was like, can I stay? Yeah. Because I knew my daddy and my mama were finna let me have it. Like, yeah. you know, my parents, they, they, were, they were cool parents. They were real cool parents. But, you know, my dad worked a lot. Like, God rest his soul, my daddy worked a lot. But he was dedicated to making sure that we had a better life. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? From the day one jump, as long as I can remember, my parents, they worked. Um, my mom worked two jobs at one point. Um, you know, my dad worked and worked his way all the way up into the Steel Corporation, you know, to give us a better life. And when we got to Alabama, he had really touched a milestone. And we went from living one sort of way to another. And in the mix of all that, you know, it was it was like... I started falling, and I put it on them. I put it all on them. Blame. I put it all on them. Everything that I could find to blame on them, I blamed on them. And then it was like, so once I had the arrest, then it was like, um, I had I had to do basically I guess what you would call drug court now, but it was like I had to go and meet like with a probation officer. I had to do like these little classes, you know, and all this stuff. And here I was, I was like fifteen years old, and I was still acting out. Well, then, next thing you know, I got mixed in with a heck of a crowd. Mm -hmm. I ended up getting kicked out of school um, and got put into an alternative school for a while. Which is worse. (laughs) Which is worse. We all just learned how to do drugs better together. Well, you know, I mean, like, there's no thing. Like, it really was. You go to prison, you come out a better crowd. Like, I just met more addicts. Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, hey, look. Oh, you're in on what I'm in on. Let's get together. I mean, so then we ended up moving. We moved to a smaller town. Um... Lakeview, Alabama, if y'all hear me representing, I love you guys. Um, My sister's still there. It was a big, big part of my life. I lived there from like 15, 16, all the way through until I was like almost 25. Little itty bitty town, exit 100 off 59, right between Tuscaloosa and Birmingham. It's a little bitty town, game day route to the University of Alabama. I get out there, so it's a little country town. I definitely do not fit in at this school. (laughs) Why not? Wow. (laughs) When I tell you this school right here, y'all, I went into this school and they all looked at me like, oh, because we moved into a really beautiful house. When I tell you my daddy bought my mama the most beautiful three-story Victorian little private lake community. I mean, it was the ideal dream home, like with the wraparound porch, you know, and everything. Absolutely gorgeous. Well, everybody in school looked at me and was like, oh, that's the new little rich girl that came from Hoover. We all was far from it. I was really the troublemaker girl that had been dabbling in and out with doing drugs, eat, you know, taking ecstasy and, you know, smoking meth. But, you know, at that time, it was like taboo. Whoa. You know what I'm saying? Like, we were not doing it like you know, it wasn't like it is in this day like and age. It was like the, the beginning age. of the ice age. Yeah. It literally yeah. was. And so, Ugh. next thing I know, I'm right? Like, I just say, it's uh, just like the cringe. It takes me, I just yeah. smell ammonia. Oh. I know, just, right? Like, it's yeah. just like, oh. So, I ended up, um, I got, actually, my bless my dad's heart once again. God rest his soul. Um, so, I got in a bunch of trouble at school. I just was nonstop. Um, and this was like right after 9-11. Um, my dad... It was, you know, dealing with his health issues on and off. Well, we get a phone call, you know, because Chelsea's gotten in trouble again. And they want my dad and and us to come and meet them at the principal's office. Y'all, bless my dad's heart. He had a whole heart attack in the principal's office while I was getting kicked out of school. Really? I am not even making this up, Like a literal heart attack. Like literal heart attack. And the whole time I'm watching him turn pale white and he's like, Chelsea, just listen to the lady, Chelsea. Just listen to the lady. And I'm like, Daddy. And he's like, just listen to the lady, Chelsea. And I'm like, okay. And I'm looking at the lady. The shop teacher, I forget what his name was. He was actually a paramedic. And he actually came in. And was like, look, like took, told my dad, like they were like, you need to get him to the hospital. And like my mom and and I like loaded him in the car, and he's like in the back seat. We rushed him to the hospital. Come to find out, my dad had had like pretty much had a heart attack. Ended up having quintuple bypass, open heart surgery. Wow. Yeah. Like uh, I mean, it was the whole thing of it. Well, did you, did you feel responsible? for I was fixing to say, was there absolutely. guilt from that? Yeah. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Um, to this day, you know, those are the things that I've had to battle with, really letting yeah. go of. Yeah. Um. You know, I put a lot of strain on my parents, on their mm-hmm. relationship, um, you know, on on their financially, um, all different things, you know, because, of course, I got kicked out of that school, totally got kicked out. Um, and then I had to go to this private school um, 
Brentwood Christian Academy, which I know this sounds terrible. You might as well have called it Crackwood Christian Academy. It was basically for kids that had been kicked out of every school there was to get kicked out of. And you nobody wanted you. Mm. And this was basically your parents paid to have you a, a babysitter for, mm. you know, basically because you were drug addicts. Like, I remember sneaking off in the bathroom and, like, snorting drugs off the back of the toilet in this place. Absolutely. Um, I did that in public school. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I mean, but I mean, literally, like, I went through all of these things, and then, like, I remember my little boyfriend at the time, um, he overdosed, like, yeah. at the school. Like, one of the girls gave him some stuff that was supposed to be liquid G, and it was actually, like, a bunch of Clorox and stuff from underneath her cabinet, and he totally fell out in the middle of school. Like, it was that kind of school. Well, we wow. call it overdose? Or yeah. Like, like it, was, it? Poison. Well, I, it Poison, was definitely, yeah. it was definitely unreal yeah. like but we went through all these things and by this time y'all I was like 16 years old and wow. I was smoking let meth me, and doing me meth on a this. daily so I know at the beginning right going to this church trying to fit in it was like hey I don't really know where does my identity lie who am I who exactly. do I want to be so I can only imagine like the blow that these, these pieces of identity that you're trying to strand together like being kicked into, you know, kicked out of one school, forced into another one. I'm now I'm at a school for the the throw it away kids. Yeah. Essentially, like, what does that do to the way that you see yourself? I was such a depressed person, yeah. and I had so much. So I always was known as the pretty girl. My sister was the the smart one. She was the soccer star. Like she did good in school. Like she graduated with an advanced diploma. Like my sister yeah. was doing it. Now my sister was out there doing it with us, but it was kind of one of those, look, if one of y'all's got to get in trouble, Chelsea, you make sure you're the one that goes down for it because Mariah is like, she's the star. And I was down for that. Like I was totally down to take down for my sister. Like my sister was my, she, you know, we fought all the time, but yet at the same time, like we were we were two right. like, thickest thieves. Thickest thieves. Like my yeah. sister and I, we were doing it together. But if there was a thing that was going to come down to it, I was going to cover Mariah. Yeah. Like I, I was going to make sure Mariah was good. Yeah. Amanda and I had that same relationship. It, yeah, mm -hmm. we, you know, we bickered, we fought, you know, all through you know, our life. And, and I was the only one doing drugs. <laughs> well, see, and my sister's older. You know, we're four years apart. Yeah, but it was like you know, everybody's like, well, you would think the older sister, and I was like, no, like my sister had it going on. Yeah, like, she even if she was out like doing drugs and stuff like that, she still had a rock on herself. Like she had it going on. Like I don't know, it was it was different like I don't understand it like yeah. I fell off maybe she just you know I know we both battled a lot with like our identities and and you know who we were but she she just I don't know she had this thing to her like she was super smart man yeah. and I always wanted that like I mean I know I'm smart now but like then y'all I went I to feel school like it's a different a kind of event. smart you know? it's a very different that kind was of smart. my sister so my sister is a surgeon okay oh wow, wow. right that's what I'm wow. saying wow. my sister's over here like in in school to be a surgeon I'm in rehab for like the third time I'm like what's <laughs> up feel ya. you know and we came from the same house you know I mean we went through the same things growing up you know the police coming in taking us yeah. all the things happen to both of us and she's about five years older than me but something clicked in her brain where she was like hey that looks like a bad time i'm gonna like kind of not do that and i was yeah. like looks like fun like let's, <laughs> yeah. let's go I was like, so like i kind of was the same like so i went through my phases you know i went through the depressions i went through you know feeling like i was just the pretty girl and it was long as i was pretty and i was yes. doing the party thing mm -hmm. i was good like you know what i'm saying like i always thought as long as i'm pretty as long as yeah. I'm pretty, I'm good. I've that got this. That is my story. I remember and you said that. That in is your my episode. story. Like, people look at yeah. me crazy when I say that, and I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like I really felt like that. Like yeah. if I'm not pretty, I'm not getting there because, because, because that's all I got going for me. I'm not smart. Exactly. I don't have. I'm not good. I'm not doing the school thing. I'm yeah. not. Let's be real. I mean, I rode horses when I was a kid, and I played soccer. But when I got to Alabama, like that all went down the drain. Mm. Like, baby, we were doing meth and we were doing X pills, <laughs> and we were focused on being pretty and partying. Like, that was my story, man. And because here's what I did: if you wanted me physically, and you would pursue me physically in my brain, that was the same was thing it. as having worth and having value and having yep. people actually love me. Yep. So attention equaled love my whole entire 100%, life. One hundred percent. Yeah. One hundred percent. I feel that. Like. I went through a lot of phase, you know, like I said, my, my parents, you know, my dad worked a lot and, you know, we, we, we didn't really, I mean, my parents were amazing, but yet at the same time, they, they were doing life, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And let's be real. Like life is hard. Like yeah. I get it now, right. now that <laughs> I'm a parent hard. and like all of this, like I look at it totally different and I'm like, God, I'm so sorry, mom. Yeah. I'm so sorry, dad. Like, like I wish my dad was alive so I could just sit down with him and mm -hmm. be like, dad. 
Like, I owe you, like, yeah. the world. Like, you're amazing. And, like, I tell my mom all the time, like, I don't think she really realizes how much I am, I love her and how much I am so sorry for the things I've done yeah. to her. But, like, when we were kids, like, I was just out there. Like, I mean, I was out there. Like, mm -hmm. I was doing the most. Like, I, I remember at 17 years old, like, I remember busting holes in my parents' walls, yeah. flipping out, smashing yeah. stuff. Like, I remember busting the out first the windows, time, girl, all the things. I remember the yeah. first time me and my sister did meth. We went to go get a bunch of X pills, and the guy was like, well, I don't have any X pills, but you can have this bag of dope. And he was like, just get a light bulb and just crush it down. And <laughs> you're in there. Like, just smoke it. But don't smoke the whole bag. And all of a sudden, me and my sister are sitting there, and we're like, oh, crap. We yeah. didn't smoke the whole bag. Like, <laughs> And yeah. we're up for like six days, like in the bedroom. Like we had the Jack and Jill bedroom. Yeah. And we were like back and forth, you know, trying to be quiet, laying in bed. Like I remember one night, I real life, like I did a bunch of meth and then I had to lay in the bed and pretend that I was like sleeping. Did you sit so still you sweated? Girl, I got up the next morning. No, 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 no. It's even better. I got up the next morning. I kid you not, I stood up and I fell out into the floor. Yeah. Because I'd been laying still for Your so legs. long and my adrenaline and everything had been going. Yeah. And I literally hit the floor and my sister was like, oh, what are we yeah. going to do now? We are in trouble we have to be at school and Chelsea's in the floor yeah like I mean we're not was, gonna go we're to not school. gonna go to yeah. school like so I mean all through this time like I'm still meeting with probation officers bouncing in and out of the little juvenile thing you know what I mean like putting my parents through pure hell like I mean it's it's real like I'm doing all these things but through all of this I am desperately struggling I'm depressed mm -hmm. I've got bipolar like I'm not a big one to put names like now I can honestly say um you know, I was diagnosed as a child, um, multiple personality disorder, borderline schizophrenic, um, bipolar disorder, manic depressive, ADD, ADHD, you know, you name it. They mm -hmm. wanted to put a name on it. Like, I remember my mom would take me to some of these therapists and like, I remember one she took me to and they literally, they, they called me so many things. We never went back. Like, I'll give her that one. Like, she was like, okay, that's just too much. But they mm -hmm. had me on all these antidepressants, like, all these different things for like all different times. Yeah. And I just kept bouncing back to the drugs. And I was how, like, as long as I get high. How do you interpret, like thinking back to all of the, the diagnoses and the labels that were given to you at that time in your life, how do you interpret that now? I just really, I think that everything, they just needed an excuse or a mm -hmm. name or a title. They needed something or someone to blame for all the things I was doing wrong. Really, it's kind of sad because it shows that society does not hold ownership I guess is the no best accountability, way to put it. accountability, ownership. Like they didn't want me, you know, but how do you put accountability on a, on a 16, 17 year old yeah. girl? You know what I'm saying? So then I guess it really boiled down to, I was just partying a lot. I was going out to nightclubs. Like I remember being like 17 years old and like walking past everybody in the line on new year's Eve. Like I was supposed to be there and them just letting me in like grown folks, nightclubs. And I'm yeah. out there uh -huh. like drinking, doing it up. But the whole thing of it all was, I was the pretty girl. Yeah. So they were letting me in. Mm -hmm. They were feeding me the drugs. They were down for it. Yeah. So I that was where it all really began. Well, then I really, I kind of pulled it together. Um, I pulled it together from like 18 till like 22. Like I still would dabble and I drank like a fish, but I got more into the, oh, I can eat Adderall. You know, oh wait, so we're are not we gonna do it meth together, anymore. <laughs> we're we're just we're just sustaining with something different yeah. is what it really boils yeah. down to. Cross addiction. Yeah, cross addiction. Mm -hmm. We went from, oh wait, I don't have to be a meth junkie. I can be an Adderall. Because it's so addict. different. Because that that's that's socially acceptable. Yeah. And you could snort a line of cocaine every now and again when you, you get too drunk. And, you, you, can, know, you can do but, a lot. You know, you can do a lot. <laughs> you can do a lot but, with it. But you know, in the eyes of of the people around me, it was like, oh, well, it wasn't trashy if you were taking right. some Adderall and drinking and it maybe doing a line of cocaine mm -hmm. when you got too drunk. That was acceptable. You know what I mean? The other people were doing it, so it was okay. So I went through that phase. Um, I had a boyfriend, kind of best friend. Like he was, he was amazing. Um, his name was Drew Scribner. Um, God took him from me really, really soon in life. Um, I'd gone through experiences with a lot of friends dying really young. Um, tragic car accidents. Um, you know, just tragic losses and. So death was really familiar for me. 
But with Drew, Drew was in and out of my life. Like, he was my first kiss. Like, I remember our braces getting stuck together when we were 14 oh, that's years great. old. <laughs> like, at the skating rink. Like, he was my best friend in the whole world. Like, I mean, and he went overseas and did tours um, in the United States Air Force and everything. So, you know, he'd be gone for times, and then he'd be back. But, like, as soon as he came back, like, y'all, he came back, and I, it was my 21st birthday, I want to say. Um, he came back, and... He wasn't back, but like a few days, I want to say. And this man got me tickets to the kickoff to the Keg in the Closet tour, um, Kenny Chesney, at like this little tiny pub in Tuscaloosa and took me to it. Y'all, I got so sloppy drunk. Um, and this will show you how much this guy loved me. Like I could do no wrong to this guy. I literally, I got sloppy drunk. I peed on tour bus tire in front of God and everybody. But I did meet Kenny Chesney, for the record, while I was peeing on tour bus while tire. While you were peeing, okay. While I was peeing Just on a tour bus tire. Okay. Yes. Yep. Met Kenny Chesney, so that was really cool. You know, great experience. But um, I ended up taking off in, in, in Drew's truck and running off with some random guy and disappearing and doing God only knows what. And then showing back up, and he was like, oh, it's okay. You know, it's okay you took my truck and disappeared and blah, blah, blah. He still loved me. Well, you know, we go forward a little further. Um, so we would be on and off, you know. We'd be, you know, hanging out. and But it was just we were always inseparable. Like, we were super tight. Um, and then 4th of July, I was 20. I don't remember the exact year. Um, I was 25. I believe 24, 24, 25. Um, 4th of July, I actually came to Mississippi. My dad was living here working. My dad would go back and forth um, from Alabama to Mississippi. And my mom and I decided we were going to go see my dad in Mississippi for the weekend for 4th of July. So I talked to Drew. Everything was great. I was like, love you, miss you, bud. You know, and I went to Alabama, I went from Alabama to Mississippi. And um, 4th of July, we hung out out on the reservoir um, I actually have, like, a picture of me that I found on my Facebook from me standing in this, like, American flag bikini, you know, just looking all peachy and happy. And, y'all, that was the saddest day of my life at that point in my life at the same time. And I see how happy I was that day. And then literally, I guess about 11 o'clock that night, I want to say it was, maybe a little later or something, I got a phone call, and they told me Drew was dead. Mm -hmm. uh, the balcony had collapsed on their apartment and he was killed and my whole everything just mm -hmm. y'all I didn't know how to take it like this person had been in my life and this was you know I'd like I said I dealt with friends dying but this hit me and this hit me hard I want to I want to I want to I want to go here with you for a second because when you first started talking about about him you said God took him from me at an early age yeah um, and I hear people, I think, I think in, in our culture, I think we have a tendency to take death so personally. Like we have a tendency to I say. Did. We I did. Girl, exactly. I was mad. Yeah. That was where my whole, look, I had a whole thing where I was very anti-God. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't like, I don't believe in God, but I was like, we aren't talking about God. Yeah. Like, yeah I know because, exactly. I was, because I God did mad. this to me. Right? I was big mad mm -hmm. because like. I had had another person, like, literally a week before Drew died. Uh, I had had another person that we buried that was, I was pretty close with him. Like, I kind of dated him off and on. Um, he had committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And, like, I literally, I had looked at Drew and told Drew after this happened, I was like, please don't die on me. Me and Drew had been in a really bad car accident together, actually. We were talking about the scars. So, this mm -hmm. scar on my head, um, me and him, we flipped in a Ford Explorer, like, like, a super bunch of times, like, 10 or so times, like, a front to back, side to side, yeah. and there was, f like, huge free weights in the back of it, and he dove on top of me so that I wouldn't get beaten by this, and, like, my head got hit with free weights. His did, too. I went out the sunroof, and, like, I came to, and I was sitting there staring at the gas tank of, like, this huge expedition, literally like laying on the ground and all I remember is I was wet because I had landed in like water or something and I was like oh my god what has happened Drew literally tried to save my life that day like actually Drew did save my life that day like I really believe that so like literally a week before he died I'd looked at him and I was like don't die on me and I will never forget it y'all he looked at me and he said he said Chelsea I'm not gonna die on you he said we have matching scars to prove that 
and literally like almost a week yeah. to the day later, he was gone. Yeah. Do you see how the wording of God took him from me? You see how that changes yeah. the way that we interpret death yeah. around us, death of the people that we yep. care about. And, and, and that's what I see happen. I work with clients every day. And, and here's, here's something I want to ask you too. And I'm going to try to tie this in with what I'm talking about, but with addiction, right? We have the power of choice. Yeah. For X amount of time. Yep. And then usually something happens, some kind of activating event, right? And we step over this line of I no longer have the power to choose. And for yep. a lot of people, that is grief. That is some kind of big trauma. And that was mine. And that and that's what I that's and where that I was, was going. Mine. Yeah. That was yeah. mine. One hundred percent that mm-hmm. was mine. Um when Drew died, so like I drove back home and we had ended up our house, they foreclosed on our house. Like my mom and dad did a quick sale all in a matter of like this week of Drew dying. Like I drove back from Mississippi. I got home. They were packing up our house and like we loaded up. I drove to Tupelo, Mississippi for his funeral, which I will never forget as long as I live. So, you know, I told y'all he was a United States airman, like, um, in the, in the air force, like he was, Look, he he served our country. Like, Mm 9-11, y'all, he went to war. Like, he was in the midst of it. And so, when he, when they did his funeral in Tupelo, like, I'll never forget this, y'all. When we came out from from the viewing, you know, you know, when they drive to the, to the graveyard, well, it was a military graveyard. Y'all, there was people on, on both sides of the road for the whole way. Like, you see me with chills Mm -hmm. on me right now talking about it. I will never forget it. Little kids grown adults, old women, old men, they were all holding American flags as we just somberly drove down this Mm -hmm. road. And I was like, oh my gosh, like the sense of honor. This is really like, he's really gone. This is really happening. But look at all these people that literally like are just are out here just thanking him for everything he did. But at the same time, I'm not grasping it. Like I'm like, I'm loaded up on Adderall, just Mm -hmm. trying to get through this, like trying not to break down. And so when we get home, they literally packed up our house and we moved to Mississippi. And I moved to Mississippi. I I started staying with my dad. And um, that was when everything got bad. And when I say bad, I mean, it got bad and it got bad fast. Because now you're trying to outrun grief. So at first it wasn't too bad. I was just drinking a lot. I say too bad. But when you get to really the point of it, you know, you'll understand why I say too bad. Um, So first we moved, we moved to, um, to Ridgeland and I was working um, for, I was working for Joe Ushery. I was um, working, I had worked in the car business. That was really all I've known. Um, I started working as a service advisor. I transferred from um, the car dealership in Alabama to the one here. And I was working there as a service advisor. I was doing good, but I was drinking. And I was drinking a lot, you know, smoking weed, you know, that kind of thing. Just trying to self-medicate and taking a lot of Adderall. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) I will never forget this as long as I live, y'all. And shout out to the man that pulled me over. I feel for that man. Um, I think his name was Officer Ainsworth um, because I gave him pure, oh, my God, I gave him a time that day. He pulled me over. We had left from the St. Paddy's Day Parade, and I was sloppy drunk. And I drove my little self over two Shuckers, and they pulled me over, like, right there, like, right on the road where you're turning towards Shuckers. And I pulled over. Lake Harbor. No, I was, like, on that road, Rice. Rice Road, yeah. I was on Rice Road. And um, <laughs> I pulled over and looked like, y'all, I'm, like, decked out with, like, all the St. Patty's Day stuff <laughs> on and everything. And, like, my cute little skirt with my little heels. Did and you have a socks. tutu on? I did. Yes, I totally ma'am. did. So totally did. Yeah. Had, like, the little tutu skirt going on with, like, uh, the little, ma'am, like, have you been knee-highs. drinking today? Yeah, that's what he said. So he literally, I pull over and he looks at me and says, ma'am, have you been drinking? I said, officer, are you a cop? And he looked at me and was like, he looked at me like, are you kidding me? And he was like, ma'am, I need you to step out of the car. And I was like, okay, I know where this is going. And he was like, ma'am, I need you to get as comfortable as you can to do your field sobriety test. So I like start taking off all my beads. I'm taking off my shoes. Like you're ready to fight. Like I'm like, I'm like getting ready for this. Like I'm totally prepared for like my moments. Yeah. Like I'm going to redeem myself. Y'all, I did not redeem myself. Uh-huh. He looked at me and he was like, ma'am, I'll tell you what, I'm going to make a deal with you. You can call whoever and tell them to pick you up down at Ridgeland PD. And, like, 
we're going to tow your car, but we're going to re like release you on your own recognizance. So I get down there and my parents come and get me like, okay. Well, needless to say, there went my career. You can't work in the car yeah. business yeah. if you have, you have SR. No, if you have, it wasn't that. I had SR22 oh, insurance. Yeah. Right. They, I still to this day don't understand how they didn't suspend my license. Once again, my dad, look, when I tell you my dad would take me into places and like we'd go into things like I totaled a car in Alabama. I was drunker than Cooter Brown and I literally, I smacked into the cement median on, on the highway doing like 110 miles an hour. Like, I'm not exaggerating. Guy in the back seat broke his neck, and I walked away with not a scratch on me. Y'all, I got out of the car, and I That's ran. That's all God, baby This girl. guy, yeah. no, this was this was unreal. Like, yeah. so this guy pulls up, and he's like, ma'am, is everything okay? Can I do anything to help you? And I was like, you can get me out of here. I had convinced this guy that my uncle was a tow truck driver, and I needed him to take me to go meet my uncle that was a tow truck driver. And so this guy <laughs> drives me to my apartment complex, and during all this, my sister's calling, and she's like, Chelsea, I'm over here, like, at your accident scene. Like, you've made a parking lot of the highway. Like, where are you? What are you doing? And I was like, I'm not coming back. You got me sideways. So you just abandoned your I abandoned oh my, my car with a guy in it with a broken back. Oh, wow. Yeah. Did, and so my what, dad, what happened next? My dad though? took me. So like, <laughs> so, like, my sister, of course, my sister, God love her, my sister. My sister tells the police exactly who I am, what my car is. And of course, you're going to know anyway because, I mean, it's registered. Yeah. So they call and reach out to my dad, and my dad's like, Chelsea, we got to go up here. Somehow my dad convinces the Hoover Police Department to let me come up there the next day. And my dad, like, on the way there, he looks at me, and he's like, look, Chelsea, whatever happens, I'm going to get you out. And I'm like, oh crap! I'm really going to jail, mm -hmm. y'all. I don't know. This is when this is when I started. I told y'all to get your popcorn. This I started one. calling my dad Priceline Negotiator after this. My dad and I go into this place like we're talking to this officer and everything, and my dad's like. He's putting it on. Like, my dad's like, oh, trust me, we're going to handle this. Like, we're going to teach her a lesson. Like, I promise you, we are, this is not acceptable behavior. Like, the whole nine yards, he's putting it on for him. And, like, the cop walks out. My dad looks at me, and he's like, they're going to let you go. They're going to let you go. It's going to be fine. And if they don't, I still got you. And I'm like, oh, okay, I got you, Daddy. I love you, Daddy. Thank you, Daddy. <laughs> you know, and all this. So the officer comes back, and he's like, okay, we've talked about it. We're going to let you go. We're going to just give you a ticket and, like, we're going to, we're not even, because, like, look, they even let us, like, go to the extent that, like, they cleaned out all of the beer bottles and beer cans out of my car when it was at, like, the tow yard. And so, like, there was no actual residual signs that I was drinking and driving because they didn't give me a breathalyzer or anything. And the cops were like, we believe your dad's really going to, you know, put it on you. We're going to let you go. Just take this as a lesson. Well, let me, let me ask you this. Do you think that it was good or bad that dad... It was terrible, girl. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah. My dad... Uh -huh. Look, I called him Diddy, and my Diddy bailed me out of everything. When and I what did you, that teach you? Oh, Lord, that I could get away with anything. Exactly. And it ended up yeah. later on in my story, you'd find out that it, it definitely mm -hmm. turned a disaster. That's exactly... Like, that's my story, man. My dad, he bailed me out over and over, starting in high school... That was onward. me. That was me. And and so what it taught me was I can do whatever the hell yep. I want to. That was and, me. And, and and never have to suffer the consequences. That was one hundred percent me. Until I got to a place in here and in here that nobody could could separate me from the consequences yeah. of that. Yeah. So anyway, I ended up. So all this happens, you know, and I got my DUI and everything. Daddy couldn't bail me out of this. Everything happens. Like I got the DUI. I had SR twenty two insurance. I lost my job. So I ended up getting a job at Shuckers. I was, you know, waiting tables. I was making good money, but I was working serious hours. So I was eating Adderall like it was going out of style. And I was drinking nonstop. Well, then I started hanging out with some people. Um, and I started casually. You know, I was doing cocaine. That was the thing that I was doing. Well, then I met this guy, and he was like, hey. He was like, you ever done meth? And I was like, yeah, back when I was younger. You know what I'm saying? He was like, oh, really? He was like, well, you want to go do some dope with me? And I was like, sure, why not? Yeah. You know? <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> why not? Yeah. You're cute. I like your tattoos. Let's go do meth. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was real. It was so sad. So I end up going back to this guy's apartment, and 
Not only do I do meth, y'all, I end up shooting meth. Oh, wow. Here we go. The the night of nights, I ended up with a tattoo on my foot that to this day is ratchet. You can't even really tell what it says. It was supposed to say day in California. I was tweaked out of my mind, and I tried to tattoo myself upside down and backwards. Had some red hot chili pepper vibes going Uh, on. That was totally the story of my life. If you listen to the song, it really is. I swear, between that one and She Talks to Angels, like I swear, they didn't know they wrote it for me, but they wrote it for Uh me. Um, So I ended up shooting up dope that night. Um, and nothing was, was ever the same. Nothing was ever the same. Um, from that moment on, it was a disaster. Mm-hmm. It was a total disaster. Um, I ended up, I ended up shooting up dope all the time. I was doing dope in my parents. Like I was living at my parents in the bedroom, shooting dope. I lost my job. Next thing you know, I'm like, I'm just shooting up dope all the time. There's spoons everywhere, needles all over the place. You know what I'm saying? Like Flip the hair can bottle I'm, upside yes, down. <laughs> like every every can, every everything. Uh-huh. Are you kidding me? And then I had this whole thing where I collected, um, I collected little spoons and like little trinket things, and every single trinket thing and, and spoon that I had to my name, like had some residue, had some on, residue it. on it. And then it got so bad to where you would look up at the ceiling and you'd see blood splatters yeah. on the ceiling. Mm-hmm. And do realize I am living at my parents' house. And so then it hit the fan and I want to say, I forget what holiday it was. It was some holiday and it hit the fan and I lost it on everybody. Well, the police ended up coming. They ended up arresting me. They didn't arrest me for the drugs that were in the house, but they definitely arrested me. I don't even remember really exactly what they, I think they got me for paraphernalia, but they didn't actually find any dope. I was probably out of dope and that's probably why I was flipping out to be right right, now that I think about it. Um, You know, and this is where my life starts to get really kind of hazy and rocky and this will show and this is for anybody out there when they sit there and say you know all the things I've done I I don't remember what I've done it's understandable to say that because I have points in my life like Mm y'all where I just don't like I don't know if it's a trauma response that I've blocked it out or if it's just really I've done that much drugs. Yeah. Like yeah. I call them the that. Xanax years. Now, but yeah, but I, I look now. I tried not to do Xanax. I wanted, I wanted well, to fight everybody. I'd rob you blind, and then I'd hide the I, Xanax absolutely. and everything I stole from you. And, and then, then I, was I thought like, it was a good time to do it heck? again. Yeah. I was like, where did all the crap I just stole go? And where's my look, drugs? I'll never Who forget me? <laughs> waking up sometimes, and I would be like out there pilfering on Xanax, thinking that I was collecting like this treasure. That's oh, like, yeah. well, and then I wake totally. up the next morning and have like dirty rings and like, yeah, you know, like. Ratty t shirts <laughs> that I had stolen from random play, like picked up off the side of the road. And like, I was like, what is this? What is that? You know, what did I just get what myself I, into? Yeah. yeah. So I went through all that. Um, I ended up, uh, they released me from, from, from jail. They took me. No, you know what? I actually, I do remember they had a warrant for me um, in Pearl. So they took me to Rankin County for a failure to appear. Or some kind of, I'd gotten caught with some weed or something. I don't know. Like, when I tell you, I bounced in and out of going to jail. But, you know, once again, that I'm pretty thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't look like a dope fiend. Yeah. I really didn't. Like, I looked like I was that college girl, goody girl that was just living the life. Yep. Like, I played the part and I played it super well. I It was like I didn't know my own identity. So I just played all these uh, different identities. I was whatever you wanted me to I was, be. That's exactly it. I was, mm-hmm. oh, you want me to be like this today? Okay, I got you. Watch this. Yeah. Hold on tight, guys, because we're going for the ride. Like, I could be whatever you wanted, and I could, I could, excuse my language, I could shit talk the best of them. Yeah. Like, I mm-hmm. really could. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just being honest. There's no be- way to sugar that, like, no, sugarcoat it. it. Like, I really could. And so... I ended up going to jail. Well, they ended up releasing me from Rankin County. I walked home from Rankin County from jail, and um, I got back, and my parents were like, look, the apartment complex says you can't live here with us anymore. Like, So I was officially kicked out. I was officially homeless. So then I, this was when I started getting mixed in with the rough, rough crowd. Yeah. Like, this is when I started hanging out with, I had a dope boy that, mm-hmm. you know, he was like, he saw dollar signs when he saw me, yep. maybe. Because not only could I play any part, I could play it and play it to the police and everybody. And he was like, let me teach you how to do something. And this is when the experiences came about where I started learning how to sell drugs and mm-hmm. do drugs. And it was like, oh, if I just move drugs, well, then I have free drugs. And so... I was shooting dope, and I was ripping and running the roads, mm-hmm. and I was going from, like, Vicksburg to Hattiesburg to, like, anywhere and everywhere. Yep. Like, 
when I tell you I've got some of the most horror stories, like, I remember we went to this, I will never forget this place as long as I live. Like, actually, you can look this place up. It was called the Bethesda Girls Home. This was a property that me and the girls that I was hanging out with at this time, um, we had convinced somebody, she had convinced somebody to, I guess, buy this property. Um, and we would go out there to this property. It was, it had been a shut down um, girls home, like kind of place. Um, if you actually look into it and do the research, the place was terrifying. Like these people, these people were tortured and like sexually abused. And like, it was a very terrible, terrible place. And like, we would go out to this place and, and stay and like hang out for like days on end and like get higher than Cooter Brown and run all over the property and everything. And I swear to you, like this place terrifies me to this day. Like you couldn't pay me money to go back there. Like nothing, like God was nowhere near this property. Like it was darkness. It was darkness, like serious darkness. And we were there one day and this is actually the story of how I ended up. I'd met my husband. My parents had done the surprise birthday party and I'd met my husband, but I had met him at a party at this party and I'd given him, he gave me his email address, y'all. This, <laughs> this is how different, well, so yeah, you gotta Gino. realize. So Gino, Gino, <laughs> God love Gino. Gino had done like 10 years in the penitentiary and Gino was just coming back to like mm-hmm. life, like yeah. out of the penitentiary. Gino had lived on the streets on and off. He'd started living with this guy over in Bellhaven. And um, so I'd met him that night. Look, y'all, I kid you not, it was so cute because I think back on that night, like that night at the party, he offered to give me a ride home. And really and truly, you guys, he had his bicycle like stashed outside <laughs> at chemistry. <laughs> and now I think about it and I'm like, how was he going to drive me home? Like he was on a bicycle, like, uh, but it was so cute. Like, but he was totally not my type, very different, very, very eccentric kind of person. But yet, he had really cool tattoos. And I was like, oh, that's, you, that's it you right do there. tattoos. I yeah. was like, you do tattoos, huh? I need you to tap me up. Like, you're going to do my tattoos. So then I kind of started talking to him. And so, like, we had kind of messaged here and there, um, you know, and texted a little bit. Well, he emailed back and forth. And, yeah, I kind of emailed. And then, I, and then I, you know, I was like, let me give you my cell Let phone me ask number. you this. Hold on. I got a question. Was it an AOL? It was, I think it was a Gmail. <laughs> yeah. It might have been. No, it wasn't. It was a. It was an Outlook, I think. Outlook. I think there it was go. Outlook. Um, but he did. He, I'll never forget it. But he, um, he, was, he was different. And so, like, I kind of talked to him on and off. But, like, I was running the roads, like, doing the most, y'all. And so we go back, and I'm at this place. And we go to this place. And, like, when I tell you there's darkness going on here, there's, like. It sounds like it's pure evil. Yeah. It was pure evil and, like, gang affiliation stuff. Like, and, like, like these are, like serious like Aryan Brotherhood mm-hmm. like these yeah. people aren't playing like kind of people well we decide to be all I'm awesome and I got this and I'm gonna go down there and we're gonna just you know take our place back over and we had seen some things there that I am not even gonna speak of because when I tell you that like it put me in fear and danger for my life but we saw some things there and they knew we'd seen some things there and they were concerned about that being of course because of what it, the extent of it was Um, and this guy was literally like flipping out on us. Like I literally, I remember him shooting through the door and we were standing outside. We were trying to open the door to get into like the property and like he shot through the door and I will never forget it. Um, the other girl that was with us and I'm sure if she's watching this, she knows who she is. Um, she literally, she had her tongue stuck out at me like laughing because we were trying to pick the door and I watched the bullet like literally go right past her tongue wow. like mm-hmm. and right past my face. And of course we jumped in the car. These guys like literally, maybe it was the meth, maybe it was really happening, uh, but we thought that they were chasing after us. We thought yeah. they were coming to kill us. And so like y'all, I went on this whole tirade tangent. Like I was running from from like Vix from like Vicksburg or not Vicksburg Hattiesburg like all the way back to Jackson thinking that this guy this Aryan Brotherhood guy is chasing after me I end up at the Red Roof Inn on High Street yeah I find these I find <laughs> these I, yeah I know right repping hey look hey. I have kids at that hotel yeah. okay like that is that is a substantial part of my story like I, I understand would, are you kidding me I went into the labor the ATM and the gas station like in front yeah. of that yeah 100%, yeah, 100%. they knew like, me well oh girl I'm, I'm banned from that hotel <clears throat> yeah. like they, they see me coming yeah. they're like 
like, not that girl. Not that girl. She cannot come here. Do She's you know, not allowed. I'm she good. cannot rent her. Do you know, I got banned from the Oyo on uh, I've been banned from them all. I'm on the no rent, like, on the like, no, how, like, yeah. So I'm how do you get banned six? from, like, the bottom of the barrel? Maybe. Maybe. Crystal methamphetamine. Crystal methamphetamine and yeah. selling yeah. drugs. Yeah. I got you beat. Try having two dogs while you're at it. We'll get to there. So, anyway, so I literally, I run into the Red Roof Inn, and I come across some ms-13s mm-hmm. and latin kings and they're mm-hmm. like we're gonna keep you safe like well, we don't like the abs we're gonna keep you safe they're like we're gonna hide you in this room and like like i said i was on a lot of meth so it's questionable if they were really chasing me at this point in time but in my mind they were after me mm-hmm. and i was gonna die well of all the people i could think of gino lived in Bellhaven. Right up the street. Mm -hmm. I called Gino, and I was like, please help me. These people are after me. They're going to kill me. Well, Gino was working with a lady, and they were starting a nonprofit organization to help people to get off the streets and, like, stuff like that. So I was like, oh, he's he's my answer. He's going to save me. Gino saved me that day. Now, what I didn't realize about Gino at that time, you know, Gino had been gang-affiliated. What I did not know, and I still to this day do not know if it had anything to do with the mix of everything and how things went my husband was a Latin king, and he, you know, he does not have anything to do with any of that anymore. Praise God. You know, we've separated ourselves from, mm-hmm. from all of that affiliation. Um, and, but, you know, all these things are all linked together. And, of course, at this time, I'm on meth. Like, my mind is everywhere. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know who to trust or is this linked with this and all this stuff. But Gino tells me to go to this man's house that's down the road. He stays on the phone with me while I'm walking down there. Y'all, I'm high as all get out. I'm walking down the road. I get there. And next thing you know, um, I'm sitting there with this dog that's like this ginormous fluffy dog. I'm putting makeup on the dog. I'm putting makeup on me. That's like, accurate. I am super, super that's high. Accurate. It's 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 yeah. real. It's meth. I don't know. How and to like I don't it. understand it. Like, and this was the real days of meth. Like yeah. uh, this is the real the raw, anhydrous. The anhydrous yeah. days. Like and so I'm back there. Well, Gino Can we shows that up. on air? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Oh, I geez. hope so. <laughs> It'll be okay. We said mine was gonna be raw. Yeah. Um <laughs> so we end up, Gino and I end up together. And Gino is my rescuer. Like, from that day forward, me and Gino were together. And that is where it starts with me and Gino. Um, And this has been, it'll be 10 years that we've been married in December. So, right about, actually, right about right now is 10 years that me and Gino have been, have been at our story. And so, from that day forward, Gino kept me safe. Um, Gino did not leave me alone. Gino and I have been through it all together when you say that you can learn to love someone Mm -hmm. on a level that is unlike anything else like I have put this man through pure hell like I have I have put him through it all I ended up getting him kicked out of the house that he was staying in on Bellhaven because I stole um I forget what it was I even stole I stole something from them and um it was like this whole ordeal and they kicked me out and him out. And like, they didn't really kick him out, but they kicked him, they kicked me out. And he was like, I'm going with her. And y'all, I'll never forget it. He, he took me to the end of high street to where like the water levee is. And he took me out there and he set up like a, uh, like a tarp and had me like a sleeping bag. And he was like, I'll be back. And it was like storming super, mm. super bad. And I remember like really being like, Oh my God, this is, this is real. Like, I'm homeless. Yeah. I have nothing. I'm freezing. And Gino was gone and I was all by myself out in the woods. And I was like, oh my God, where, where did I go wrong? Mm -hmm. Like the moment that you said when it goes from, yeah, I don't have control anymore. I have, this is when I finally realized for the first time that I'm a junkie, that it's real. Like I will do any and everything Mm -hmm to shoot dope in my veins like there is there's no stopping it and not only that I will I would just do do anything like I didn't Mm -hmm. care who it hurt I didn't care who it brought down I'd bring you down with me the dope is mom dad every power are you kidding me like it's it's everything yeah and that's that's my story because I got to that point to where Every bridge I walked across in every relationship that I had I poured kerosene on all that oh me too 100 percent now internally in my heart i knew that i loved these people yeah Yeah. but it had such a stronghold on Mm -hmm. me that i just i did not care i didn't care i mean it's not it's Mm -hmm. hard to say that i didn't that i did not care but i mean it's like a pattern 
you know, the yeah. ones that you love the most is the, are the ones that you're going to hurt the most. But it's it's survival, though. And I know I talk about this all the time, but it, it's because it fascinates me, though, the way that survival and pleasure in your brain wire together. So, so it's not about I don't care about these people. It looks like that yeah. to the people, right? right. Yeah. And, and I have guilt and shame because I know exactly. it looks like that to the people. But my brain has been so rewired by mm. addiction and all of the consequences Programmed. that go along with addiction yeah. and the grief and the trauma and the pain and the abandonment and the rejection and all of that, that my brain literally thinks I, in order to take my next breath, I have to go get these drugs. Exactly. Yes. So I, I it, it, it hurts me when I see, hear people say that, like, I didn't care about anything because I'm like, I think maybe that you did. Well, I think I did care, yeah. but my whole thing was this had become my identity. Yeah. This was who I was. Yeah, I was, I was, the fact a, that I, was a I was a drug dealer. Well, in my eyes, though, you know. I was content with it. I thought I was cool. Yeah. I thought I was oh, cool. Oh, baby, look, I was I in can with do the all. Gangs. Yeah. yeah. I was uh -huh. in with the gangs. I could walk into anywhere. Uh, I had respect. I had respect. You know, it's about respect. It was like I had yeah. I had this whole claim yeah. to it. Do you know through uh, after Amanda died when I went to the like straight out in the streets of Jackson and I walked Jackson and and met those same type of people that yeah. you're talking about yeah. and I walked into these places with absolutely no fear. South Jackson, West Jackson. Man, let me tell you what. Y'all look at me. Okay, now care. I'm a little bigger now than I was <laughs> I know, back I'm then. I'm not. But, I mean, <laughs> I was I was 4'11", 100 pounds, 115 pounds soaking wet. And I thought I was, mm -hmm. I could, I thought I was invisible. I mean, I had people that I could call. I was like, I will shoot you. I didn't care about nothing. Baby, I got the drugs. I got the things. This is me. I'm yeah. awesome. I'm pretty. I got you. Bulletproof. Let's That's go how party. I was, too. Bulletproof. Bulletproof. Until I hit them woods. But I'm and like, then, is it confidence or is it desperation? It's a little bit of both. Okay. It's a little bit of both, yeah. I think, because you're, you're at a point where you've hit the rock bottom. So it's like, this is all there is. Yep. Like, so it's either like, like knuck up, you know what I'm saying? Like buck up buttercup. Mm -hmm. This is the ride and you better do it. And if you're going to do it, do it all the yeah. way. And so I decided I was going to do it all the way. So we were out in the woods and we lived out in the woods for a while. Like, but I was still connected. Well, then I ended up pregnant. Mm -hmm. I ended up pregnant with Phoenix. All right. Hold on. Not to not to cut you short, but we still have a lot of yeah, story to tell. All yeah, right, we do. so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do a part two, okay? Okay. Because okay. I feel like we've got another hour and a half in this. <laughs> because she's, I, I've heard the story. She's got a long way to go. So we're gonna we're gonna button this up for today. Okay. And uh, we're gonna we're, we're gonna pick this back up next. Is week. It, isn't there a picture? Oh yeah. Can we, we can, can we leave them with oh, the, yeah. can we leave them with the we can leave them with the pictures? Yeah. Because this is this is where it came into. Yeah. Like, well, actually, I was actually pregnant with Keezy. Like, I didn't fly a sign while I was pregnant with Phoenix. I actually started flying a sign later on. But that right there, I have a $100 bill in my hand, and my sign says, anything helps. Um, what does it say? Pregnant and in need of some help and prayer. Wow. Thanks and God bless. And, wow. y'all, this is the saddest part. Like, I really wasn't in touch with God there. But I had learned that if you put... Thank you and God bless and needed yeah. help and prayer. Oh, they, they throw that money was your money you. side. Yeah. They, they throw money. And I had actually literally gotten out there. I was huge pregnant. I was like eight, eight, eight and a half months pregnant with Kesey. Mm -hmm. And the first car at the first like red light, lady pulled up and handed me a hundred dollar bill, mm -hmm. and it paid for my my rent. Yeah, at the select ten mm -hmm. to keep the roof over our head. Um, and then that that picture in the middle. Ooh wee! That was the day Look I at those checked eyes. into rehab. You must have just did a shot. I love I how had, meth takes your so eyebrows away. So let me tell y'all something. I know, right? They just, <laughs> like, they're you gone. Just, you just, like, they're what gone. happened to them? Like, mine ran gone. away from me. I mean, other. it took it everything. Crazy. All I had was cheekbones, nose, and and yeah. and chin yeah. and forehead. God, look at all that forehead and eyeball. I mean, you could watch like, a movie on that. Forehead. I mean, you could. Wow, like, it was John. in there. And then I had the Little Mermaid <laughs> hair. Like the Little Mermaid hair. Like that was real. That box eye girl. That was that box. That was that box on box on box. Like, I've got I've got mm -mm. pictures of my baby sister that and that look just like that yeah. middle picture. Oh yeah, does she have that yeah. box on box on oh, box yeah. tattoo? Oh, yeah. I dye mine red too. Well, let me tell you, yeah. like yeah, I would steal it from Walmart and then dye my hair red, and it that, just would. That yeah. was like I would go to Sally's Beauty Supply and I would pick out all different colors, and then I'd get home and I'd end up mixing them all together. I love that. And I was like, look at my amazing color I made, <laughs> and it was like I'm a signature. Here's the sign. Here's your drug dealer. Yeah. This is your this is your South Jackson. Tell drug me dealer. you're on meth without yeah. telling me on your meth. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> 
said, <laughs> and that is it right there. We should make a slogan with that yeah. picture right there. Yeah. Tell me you're on meth without yeah. telling me you're on meth. That is it all the way. I'll go first. Like, yes. Yeah, like, so see, but the thing is, is like in the anything helps picture, I wasn't actually on meth. I had stopped doing meth because I had lost all my other kids. Yeah to not, you know, to not being sober. Well, I take that back. Like Falcon, my son that had passed away, um, with him, I had gotten sober. Mm. And then he passed away at four weeks old. And the whole incident in itself, um, I had actually, I had fell asleep while I was feeding my son. And he suffocated in my jacket. Well, yeah. I want to, I want to, because I think what John was saying, yeah. I think that this, we I need think to save some of this. For this part, part of okay. your yeah. story this, this deserves yeah. time. Yeah. So to hear yeah. the rest of this story from darkness into light, tune in next week yes. for the Black All Sheep right. Recovery Warfare. You didn't podcast. know you were going to get roped in oh, two man. weekends in Look, a row. Look, I know, I right? I should have <laughs> known. I should have known. This might even continue into a three. Oh, well, Lord. this might be a trilogy. Y'all. Chelsea, we're so grateful for you. Yes, and thank you guys thank for you having so me. Thank you so much for being vulnerable and being willing to do this. Are you yeah. kidding me? I didn't know John was going to put the whole childhood of recklessness yeah. into the mix, uh, too. Childhood matters, oh, though. I'm yes, it Context does. Context matters. It does. Thank you guys so much. I enjoyed it. Oh, my. <laughs>